Got the tone, 8 o'clock. Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark cards bring you a true story from the life of Albert Schweitzer on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. And here is our distinguished host, Mr. Lionel Barrymore. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Hallmark Hall of Fame. A few years ago, a poll was conducted of the leading minds of our time, scientists and philosophers, physicists and, and men of literature, and the question was this. Who, in your opinion, is the greatest man alive today? The answer was practically unanimous. And that man is the subject of our story tonight. His name is Albert Schweitzer. And you will hear his amazing true story in just a moment. But first, here is Frank Goss. There are Hallmark cards for every day in the year. For every day in the year is made happier by a Hallmark card. Not only the special occasions, anniversaries, birthdays, and holidays, but the Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays of everyday living are made brighter, richer when you send a Hallmark card. Because a Hallmark card says just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. And on the back is that identifying Hallmark that says, you cared enough to send the very best. Lionel Barrymore appears by arrangement with MGM, producers of Executive Suite, starring William Holden, June Allison, Barbara Stanwyck, Frederick March, Walter Pigeon, Shelley Winters, Paul Douglas, and Louis Calhoun. And now, Mr. Barrymore brings you tonight's exciting true story on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. is being played by Albert Schweitzer and was recorded at the parish church in Gunsbach, Alsace. And it was here that he was born, 79 years ago. The son of a minister, Schweitzer was soon widely recognized as an organist of great promise. He was brilliant in his studies, too, with degrees from Paris and Berlin and Strasbourg. He wrote remarkable papers books on Bach, Goethe, Manuel Kant, and the meaning of Christ. And at 30, Albert Schweitzer had found success and happiness in all the fields of his interests. Principal of the University of Strasbourg, invitations to give organ concerts in all the capitals of the world, a fond and distinguished group of friends and colleagues, and a loving wife. And although I regret that this announcement comes to you as a shock, I must explain that this is no sudden whim. Indeed, I should not expect it to be such. No, Father, this decision was made nine years ago, in 1896, when I was 21. But uh, about this, uh, this throwing away of all you have? Well, when I had reached my 21st birthday, I paused and I took stock. And it was then that I first realized that my capacity for happiness, for the enjoyment of life, was perhaps unusually developed. That which I wanted, I could have. Anything. I had but to set my mind and hand to it, and it was done. To be sure, but what has that to do with this uh, plan of yours? With those about me, this fortunate gift seems not to be the rule. Now, it has always seemed to me that one must give something in return for happiness. Not accept happiness as a matter of course. So, I made a decision. I would live for my science and art until my 30th year, and from that time forward, I would devote myself to the direct service of humanity. But, but Albert, you do not make yourself clear. The service of humanity, what would that entail? To begin with, I must become a doctor. But you are a doctor. No, I mean a doctor of medicine, Father, not philosophy. Of medicine? 
Oh, but you are not a beardless boy just starting his life. You, you are 30 years old. You have a career. Your work here at the university, your, your concert. There are others who can teach, who can lecture, who can play music, many others. You say you want to serve humanity. I say you are serving humanity right here with what you are doing. Wait, You're... Father. Albert, it takes eight years to obtain a medical degree. I, I don't doubt that you can do it. But when you have, what then? There is a place in Africa in the northern part of the Congo, where much is needed. Food, medicine, help, an abandoned mission in a place called Lambarini. You want to be a missionary? No, no, I don't want to be a missionary. I'm not going into the jungle to sell some particular style of worship. I intend to help people, Father, in as genuine and direct a manner as I can. I have a philosophy, a creed to live by. It may be summed up simply reverence for life. June the 11th, 1913. At long last, I have received my degree in medicine. Fortunately, I have found time to write two books on Johann Sebastian Bach and a survey of all the books written on the life of our Lord Jesus. And now, at last, my dear wife and I have arrived in Africa. Albert! Yes, my dear? The riverboat. It has brought new supplies. The ones you ordered from the end. Ah, ah, that is good. And uh, books, books? No, oh. no books. Oh. Hmm. No books, no temptations, hmm? So I can finish building the new dispensary. Your father writes. Oh, what does he say? The war grows worse. The university has been emptied of its young men. And uh, he had a visit from two officers of the German army. What did they want? You? Me? Why? They are conscripting all doctors. Who? He told them that you are in the jungles of French Equatorial Africa. And if they want you badly enough, they could come and find you. <laughs> so, they went away. Uh, civilization. The district commandant came up on the boat. He stopped to talk to some of the natives. I wonder what he wants. Oh, probably some more fruit or medicine for his wife. Mm. Could I help you with the steer? If you will. Tamba went off and left me single-handed again. Pick up the end of the plank and hold it in line. Mm, so. Oh, like this? That's it. Yeah. Here we have one thing to be thankful for, my dear. I wish you'd tell me what it is. The war is 3,000 miles away and cannot touch us or our work. Albert. Ah, we have a visitor. Good afternoon, Doctor. Monsieur le Commandant. How nice to see you. And you, sir. Madame? Monsieur. Shall we all go down to the house and have tea? Uh, later. <sighs> Amazing. Formidable. <laughs> Monsieur. What you have done in the few short months since my last visit to Lambarini? Now this, this new building, what is it to be? Oh, this will be our new dispensary. The old one's going to be made into a small chapel. We've been holding Sunday morning services out of doors, but with the rainy season coming, we don't want to get caught the way we did last year. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, now the reason As for... you came up the path, did you see the new orchard? Uh, yes, splendid. But you have something on your mind, Monsieur Le Commandant, do you not? Uh, yes, Doctor, I do. Do not hesitate. We are friends. I... Well, the fact of the matter is this. I have received an order that all enemy aliens are to be interned for the duration of European hostilities. Enemy aliens? German citizens. Oh, will we have to leave Lamborghini? No, but my orders are that you are not to be allowed to practice medicine on French subjects. By French subjects? Do you refer to the natives? Those are my orders. Oh, fantastic. These people cannot even speak French. Why not one in a hundred has even heard of your country? I am sorry. What has France done for them? That you should now take the role of paternal protector, protector against the dangerous enemy alien Schweitzer? Have you given them food when they need it? No. Have you sent in your educators? No. Have you supplied them with protection against disease? No. 
I do not originate this order, Doctor. Then I suggest, sir, that you correspond with those who did and see if it cannot be changed. These matters are not so simple as that. Then tell me. If a man is brought to me this hour, one such as I had yesterday, a man mauled by a lion, his arm half torn from his body, what shall I do? Shall I stand aside and tell him of the glories of France? Or shall I give him medical care? These orders must be enforced. And to that end, I am leaving two guards, natives, to see that they are. And if the native guards fall ill... Albert, please. One question, monsieur. Yes? If your wife should again fall ill, Albert saved her life. Last year, you know. I know. It is a dilemma. Think on it, monsieur. And that. Start writing those letters. I shall. And now, shall we have tea? Just a moment. Oh, oh, you're writing again. How's the new book coming? Oh, fine. One of the benefits of being interned, time to think, to write. There are two more natives outside. What's the trouble? The same as that with the man yesterday. Oh, Schweitzer's surreptitious surgery. And he is back. Mm -hmm. The commandant? Yes. Eighteen months of this sneaking about. Where are they? In the dispensary? Oh, uh, who in the dispensary? Oh, it is you. Hmm? I repeat, Doctor. What is this about the dispensary? Uh, two of your loyal native subjects, Monsieur le Commandant. You have received your orders on this subject, Herr Doctor. Then as District Commandant, I would suggest you take care of these men. Hmm? What's wrong with them? They have leprosy. Oh. Now, what is the occasion of this visit? Have you decided to increase our native guard? No, Doctor. It is a little worse than that. What then? I have carried on a lengthy correspondence with France on your behalf, Doctor. As you know, for all our differences, I hold you in some esteem. I thank you. But now there have come new orders concerning you and your wife. Orders which I cannot fight. What is it? What more can your government do to us? Orders have come that all prisoners of war are to be transferred without delay to Europe for rigid internment. Europe? No, I, I, I don't understand. What is this word, rigid internment? What does that mean? It means that you and your wife are to be sent to a prison camp in France. And now, may I notify you with all personal regret that you are under arrest. In just a moment, we bring you the second act of the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Did you ever think of the many ways each of us likes to express our own individuality? Or even a man chooses ties to reflect his temperament, either conservative or a little on the bold side. A woman expresses herself in clothes and in the way she decorates her home. And there's another way one can show personality and taste. That's with Hallmark gift wraps. For in the wide selection of Hallmark gift wraps, you'll find designs and color combinations that seem custom-made for you. If you have a flair for modern design, you'll want new Hallmark gift wraps in the subtle tones and abstract patterns of a prize-winning painting. Or if you prefer traditional beauty, you'll choose Hallmark designs with the exquisite shadings of a French print. For flower lovers, there are papers as fresh as a spring garden and stunning stripes for those who like the bright and bold. You'll see tags, seals, and ribbons for you to match or blend, too. So to express your good taste and the extra thoughtfulness that makes your gift treasured, look for wrappings with the hallmark and crown on the package, the symbol that says, you care enough to send the very best. And now Lionel Barrymore brings you the second act of our true story of Albert Schweitzer.
now we continue with our glimpse into the life of Albert Schweitzer. And our story concerns a little known span, not of the proud moment just recently when he was awarded the Nobel Prize, but of the time when, during the First World War, he and his wife were held by the French as enemy prisoners. It's an instructive glimpse into the life of a wonderful man. The Schweitzers were shipped under guard to Bordeaux, and from there they were sent to a grim prison in the Pyrenees. Its name was Garisol. You there, you. Are your belongings open and ready for inspection yet? They are. Very well. The lieutenant will look them over. What about your papers, Albert? Do you think they'll return them? There is nothing in them that could be construed as dangerous, my dear. I saw to that. But, but the book you've been working on, the, the philosophy of civilization, you, you told me it will upset many people when it's published. Scholars will be upset. Philosophers will be upset. Tinkers will be upset. But soldiers... <laughs> no, no. On the boat, I gave the chapters new headings, very boring and dry headings, pedagogical. Oh, how can you laugh? <laughs> I was thinking of the lieutenant reading my manuscript. The Alsatian prisoners from Africa are ready for inspection, lieutenant. Yeah, bon, bon. Now, you, these papers and books, they are yours? Yes. I have inspected them carefully, very carefully. Ah, so? This manuscript... Philosophy of civilization. Do you want my opinion? Yes. Rubbish. Milk sub. Words, words, words. Give me the manuscript. Uh, what, what about my books? Your books, you can have them back, except for one. And the brass of you, the unmitigated brass of you, makes one one there. I, I don't understand. Politics. You have in your possession a book. Name, politics, by this writer, uh, uh, Aristotle. Hmm. See, politics by Aristotle. And you try to smuggle that into my prison. I'll deny that if you dare. Uh, I, uh, I cannot deny it, Lieutenant. I should like to point out, however, that this is a very old book. It was written long before the time of Christ. So? You, soldier, we, we took your degree. Is that true? I'm afraid it is, sir. Yeah. It was written by a Greek, and if I recall rightly, concerns vague theories of government. All right, all right, then give it to him. Give it to him, don't waste time. Hmm? No. Your belongings. Uh, I see drugs. Oh, I see poison, perhaps. Huh? Uh, sharp knives and steel things. What is all this? I am a doctor. Oh, doctor. You expect to earn money in this place? No, no, I never charge for healing the sick. Never? Never. You are either a liar, which I would not doubt since you are a Bosch, or you are a very unusual doctor indeed. All right, that will be all. I send them to quarters. <laughs> Carrezan is a strange sort of prison. You know, it, it's difficult, in a way, to think of it as a prison at all. I mean, for centuries, the monks lived here voluntarily. Exactly, but prison it is, and one has but to look at the faces in the courtyard to know it. What, what do you mean, Albert? Something is lacking in them. There is no inner energy. If they could but look about them, this place is an encyclopedia of the arts. There's so much to learn. Writers, musicians, painters, professors, all the languages. Oh, Albert, so Albert. much to learn to do. Dr. Schweitzer. Yes. My name is Borkelow, Doctor. Uh, how do you do? How do you do? This is Mrs. Schweitzer. How do you do, Mr. Borkelow? I was wondering if there's anything I might do for you, Doctor. Uh, you don't know it, but I, I am deeply in your debt. Oh, oh, how so? Uh, two years ago, you gave a man named uh, Klassen a package of medicines. Uh, that was, as I understand it, in Africa. Klassen? Klassen? Oh, yes. A timber merchant. Yeah, he was later brought here. Uh, the medicines he used to ease the suffering of my wife. She was dying at the time. Oh, I'm so 
so sorry. The point is, well, I want to repay you if I could make you something. Uh, don't tell anybody this, but uh, I am a carpenter. Now, why should you keep that a secret? I have my reasons. A table. Could you make a table? Oh, it's the easiest thing in the world. If the doctor had a table, he could get back to his book. Oh, it's done. How big a table would you want, Doctor? About the length of an organ keyboard. Hmm? I think that while I'm here, I should like to get in a little practice. <laughs> Hey, Doctor. Yes? Don't tell me you're going loony like some of those others. No. Then what is it? You're sitting here with your eyes shut, diddling your fingers on the edge of the table. I used to be an organist. I like to keep my fingers limber. Oh, here, Doctor. You have a letter. Letter? Here? Yes. It looks like it's been halfway around the world. It is from my father. Oh. <laughs> Practicing the organ, eh? Let me remind you, Doctor. Music is forbidden after nine o'clock. I wouldn't want to keep the other prisoners awake, you know. <laughs> My dear son, I do not know where you are. I do not even know if this letter will ever reach you. It is with heavy heart that I write to tell you your mother is dead. She was killed last week on the little road north of the village. She had been to the shrine to pray for the sick and the suffering. On her return, she was knocked down and trampled to death by a troop of cavalry. May God rest her soul in peace. I miss you, my son. It is selfish of me to want you back here in Bruce Park. Now mind, don't touch the bandage for any reason, and come back tomorrow. Hey, Dr. Schweitzer. Yes? I need some information from you. When you came here, you described yourself simply as a medical doctor. Correct? Correct. Mm. Is that all? No, I sometimes write books. No, no. But you are not what might be described as uh, a person of great note, huh? <laughs> no. No, not what one might call a distinguished doctor. Eh? No. Not a specialist, perhaps. Definitely not. Oh, merci, merci. Now I wonder what all that was about. Doctor. Hmm. Oh, hello, poor fellow. Uh, doctor, it, it's terrible. It's terrible. Here, here, sit down. Tell me about it. They are rounding up the notables. They are to be reprisals unless the German army desists in their treatment of the Belgians. Ah, oh, no. It's dreadful. I, I shall be shot. You, you... Borkalo, you are not a notable. When I came here, they said, Borkalo, what are you? And I thought if I tell them I am important, they would be afraid to do anything to me. So, so? so I told them I was a, a big contractor back in Vienna. Oh. Tell them the truth. You are a carpenter. I've oh, tried. Well, don't worry, Borkalo. I will help you. I'll show them the table. It's proof enough. And you, Doctor... Will they not use you? Your name is known all over the world. I have had my interrogation. Jesus tells us that the humble are the blessed. I wrote a monograph on that once. I never dreamed it could have such a literal meaning. You will put in a word for me. Yes, yes. But, boy, fellow. Yes, doctor. You might try praying to Jesus for help in this. Jesus? Yes. He was a carpenter, too. I think he'll understand. Albert Schweitzer's gentle humor and infinite willingness to help his fellow man ease the pain and emotional suffering of his fellow prisoners at Gereson, and later at the prison of Saint-Rémy. And it's an actual fact that his humility saved his life. 
By example, he helped those about him put their faith in God. With the wars ending, Albert Schweitzer returned to Africa, to Lamborghini, to his dedicated work. It's nice to know that there is such a man on Earth. He'll be 80 years old this coming year, but there's a strength about him, a spiritual strength and a power of spirit which the years can't dim. And we salute you tonight in your faraway post of mercy, Albert Schweitzer. <laughs> Mr. Barrymore will return in just a moment. How many times have you thought of someone you admire very much and said to yourself, gee, he's lucky, he has everything? And it does seem that some fortunate people are born with both talent and a winning personality. Well, we can't acquire a natural talent, but each of us can develop a more winning personality. For what is it that makes a person popular and loved? Isn't it their ability to give themselves to others, to think of others, and to show that interest in heartwarming ways? Well, we too can develop that wonderful trait of thoughtfulness. One of the best ways, of course, is by sending cards, and I sincerely believe that you will find Hallmark cards are the best messengers to carry your goodwill and create goodwill in others. For Hallmark cards are thoughtfully designed by artists and writers whose first purpose is to give your card a spirit of true warmth and friendliness, a card that carries a message as spontaneous and unaffected as if you were speaking it. So stop soon at a fine store where Hallmark cards are featured and choose some for your friends. They'll know, too, by the familiar Hallmark and crown on the back that you cared enough to send the very best. And now here again is Lionel Barrymore. Frank, you certainly have a good point there. The older I get, the more I realize that a person should count their riches, not in dollars and cents, but, but by the number of people they can call friends. Uh, next week on the Hallmark Hall of Fame, we have a very special occasion indeed. Our story concerns an incident in the life of the late Damon Runyon, newspaper man, humorist, and one of America's most brilliant short story writers. And here to tell it to you will be the famous biographer, Gene Fowler, who was also one of Damon Runyon's closest personal friends. And starring in the title role, Mr. Van Heflin. <laughs> I know you'll want to be listening next week when we tell you a little-known story from the life of the man who created Runyon Ease. <laughs> and those short stories have kept a nation laughing. Well, until then, this is Lionel Barrymore saying good night. <laughs> Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Our producer director is William Prude. Our script tonight by James Poe. Whitfield Connor was heard as Albert Schweitzer. Featured in our cast were Barbara Eiler, Herb Butterfield, Byron Kane, Lawrence Dobkin, Lou Krugman, and Paul Dubois. Listen to the Hallmark Hall of Fame on television next Sunday when we present Herman Melville's famous classic of the sea, Moby Dick. This is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you until next week at the same time when we'll present a true story from the life of Damon Runyon starring Van Heflin and Gene Fowler. The following week, Miss Helen Hayes returns in one of her most famous roles as Victoria Regina on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. This is the CBS Radio Network. This is KMBC Kansas City, Missouri. <laughs>